Okay, so we're talking about hospice with Daryl DeMello, Dr. Daryl DeMello, and I was just reading to him from an article that talks about the pros and cons of hospice, and I was making the point that, according to this article, um, if you choose hospice, you can massively reduce, if you're like the family of an elderly person who may have cancer but may not necessarily be at the very last, last stages of life because cancer isn't always immediately fatal, um, that once that, that for the family it can be really enticing to go hospice because Medicare and Medicaid cover so much of the expenses when you're going with hospice that they won't cover if you're actually trying to keep your loved one alive for as long as possible and healthy as, as much as possible. So go ahead, Daryl. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, since I practice in India, I will talk mainly about India, but give you a comment on the U.S. situation. Here, when people chose hospices because they can't take care of the loved one at home, and usually it's a terminally ill, terminally ill patient who is put into hospice where there are people to take care of them, but it's, it's mainly an end-of-life decision where whether it takes days or weeks or months, uh, the person is looked after in the hospice and it's, it's done. Uh, many times families can't look after their loved ones at home, so that's why they they make those decisions where somebody is taken care of full time, 24 hours, and it's an end of life scenario. So terminally ill people really go into that kind of scenario. In the U.S., hospice means, in my at least from my my uh, uh, learning, is that it's an end of life. You know, do not res uh, resuscitate. Uh, do not do anything for me. No nasogastric tubes, uh, IV fluids, dialysis. Lots of procedures are not done in hospice, at least from what I understand. If I'm wrong, my apologies up front. But that's what I understand about hospice in the U.S. It's also an end-of-life scenario. Again, whether it takes days, weeks, or months, it's something that it's an end of life decision somebody makes for the patient or the patient makes it makes that decision for his or herself so for, yes for example if a if a patient were to leave the hospital and go into a hospice and they had a diagnosis on the way out of the hospital of difficulty swallowing um, would it be expected or or, or could should that patient, let's put it in from the patient's perspective, should that patient expect to have IV supplementation or, like you say, the, the feeding tube, should they expect that that would be denied them? Because, I mean, I'm looking... Uh, in a hospice here, here in India, no. Uh, the nasogastric tube would be used to feed the patient. Uh, an epigastric tube... Even a tube that's put directly into the stomach could be used to feed the patient. Uh, unless the patient, him or herself, says, I do not want, I want to die right now. Right. So till, till, till the cancer or whatever the illness is takes over the patient, they will continue to be fed. The IV fluids are given only when, when there is severe dehydration. There's severe electrolyte imbalance. Uh, here in India, you know, most parts of India are very, very hot so and humid. So dehydration is a big, big problem here. So rehydrating the patient either is done through the nasogastric tube, which is difficult. You can't give that much of water. You can give food, but not that much of water all the time. So giving IV fluids makes makes practical sense. Otherwise, it's, it, uh, in, in the U.S., I don't know. I've never had the experience of working in the U.S. in a hospice or in a hospital situation, so I can't make a comment on that. Right. So if a person had hyponatremia, uh, low sodium, is that something that could be addressed by means of IV? Absolutely. Hyponatremia uh, is an absolute indication for giving Inter intravenous, uh, you can give dextrose normal saline or give plain normal saline uh, through, the, through the IV fluid, uh, through the IV set, infusion set. Okay. Absolutely is required. Yeah. So 
because the, the scenario I'm kind of familiar with is one that involves a person that had a diagnosis for acute hyponatremia. Uh, their EGFR numbers were, they, they had dropped. This was a person who got remdesivir at the hospital, and in like the seven days after the receipt of two doses of remdesivir before the patient um, declined to receive any more, the EGFR numbers for the kidneys went down from 46 to 36 over four days. Uh, and then the person was basically discharged to a, a rehab, but in speaking with the rehab uh, staff, we were also told that they had like a side business where they do hospice. And we found this uh, a little troubling because we learned this several days into the stay, and we had just been disturbed at the fact that we couldn't seem to prevail upon them to give our friend an IV. We couldn't seem to prevail upon them to do blood panels to see what the, what the current status of the kidneys was. And then there were these other issues. There was acute, acute severe weakness. And, and so, or, or I'm sorry, general, acute general weakness was, I think, one of the diagnoses. So between the hyponatremia, I'm sorry, hyponatremia, the kidney uh, decline, um, the, in, the difficulty in swallowing, the, the weakness, you know, one would conclude that, you know, this person basically, in a hospice setting, they're basically just going to be placed in a room and three meals are going to be brought to them a day. And then it's going to be like, well, if you can get this down your throat into your stomach and it actually digests, great. Um, but if you can't, I guess you're just going to starve to death. And so if they can't get the food down and they start to starve, or if the urea levels from the kidneys start to go up, all these things in combination, uh, wouldn't you expect over a certain period of time that there would be some pretty massive, uh, uncomfortable, massively uncomfortable general pain that those kinds of things, factors all working together would begin to produce in the patient? Yeah, pain is one thing, but more importantly, the patient would have, uh, especially if they have hyponatremia, they'll have arrh arrhythmia, irregular heartbeats. Right. And they'd have, they, which means they'll end up feeling very uneasy because arrh arrhythmias cause uneasiness, cause chest pain. They'd be very disoriented. So, uh, because again, hyponatremia in the brain means the brain's brain's neurons are not functioning properly, they're misfiring. When they misfire, the signaling goes wrong. And when signaling goes wrong, total disorientation happens. So right. so that's that's what happens with hyponatremia. So do you mean it's easily fixed. It's an easy fix. Right. At the least nasogastric tube and push in fluids, uh, you know, push in electrolytes uh, through the nasogastric tube at least. Uh, even if there's nobody qualified in the hospital to give an IV, and I mean in the hospice to give an IV, I'm sure the nurses are qualified to give IVs there. Uh, they would give intravenous at least, uh, or at least through a nasogastric tube. Nasogastric tube, most hospital healthcare workers, including the aides and the junior nurses and the nursing assistants and all, all are trained to you know, put in a nasogastric tube and then feed or push liquids through the nasogastric tube. So we, that would have been the minimum that I would expect uh, somebody to get okay. in the hospital without, without, without even the in intervention of a doctor. So when yes, you mentioned, uh, when you mentioned disorientation, were you talking about mental disorientation? Yeah, I'm talking about mental uh, disorientation. Okay. There's only one type of disorientation is right. mental. So if a person... your brain goes crazy, if your if if the uh, neurons in the brain are misfiring, or and your brain's working irregularly, you're going to suffer. You're going to have problems. You're not going to where you are. You're not going to know where you are. You're not going to be determined. You're going to be, you know, totally disoriented. So if a person um, on discharge from a hospital after being told that the hospital had consulted with a certain family member. Uh, were to have expressed alarm that that person wasn't designated as a medical contact. Um, but then they were to be deprived in the way that we're t discussing for like, say, five days afterwards. Is it possible that the mental decline would make them susceptible to that family member once they cut off communication with the other individuals that were, that were actually the designated cons con consults for at least receiving medical information? Is it possible that they could 
perhaps have an easier time inducing that family member to reverse their decision and designate them as power of attorney. And get, when your brain, when, when your brain is disoriented due to hyponatremia and it keeps getting accelerated, keeps getting worse, uh, the hyponatremia worsens. <clears throat> I mean, at that time, the person just will say any, will say yes to anything. Right. You so, know, so or things, may not even say yes. It may, you may just take it for granted and get it done. Right. So a person, you know, for instance, so, a person, for instance, who had refused multiple times requests to sign a DNR in the hospital might be persuaded under this kind of stress to sign a DNR, a do not resuscitate. It's all possible, Mike. It's difficult mm -hmm. for me to give you a, a specific answer for a specific specific indication or specific case. Right. But everything is possible. Everything's on the table here. Right. Because the sad thing about the story that I'm basically discussing with you is that you know, we were on the phone with this person when the hospital staff came in and, and let her know that she was about to be transferred to a rehab. And we were rather alarmed because she had just been in the, she was still in the ICU as of 12 hours earlier. So they were moving her, you know, with just a 12 hour interim, they went from ICU straight to a rehab. And when, when they, when they came into the room, they basically already had the, the people that were going to transport her to the next facility, you know, in a different place in the city, right? So, so they came in and they're like, we're ready to take you to your next destination. And we were on the phone with her and the people on the phone were actually her designated, you know, included her designated medical contacts. And we were like, what are you talking about? How can you possibly be getting her out of the hospital when she is still has so many issues still that need to be addressed? by you know real experts i mean we we knew for, i mean the the biggest concern we had was that she was going to return back to her home to the family situation where we really did not feel that they were up to addressing the things that we were aware of because she had given us access to her medical records and we could see these various diagnoses that were still i mean she had like 22 different pills that she was supposed to be taking at this time for various conditions so um not to mention like eye drops for glaucoma etc but uh you know, all of a sudden we're making this hospital staff are aware that the person that they spoke to to get permission to move her where they're moving her was not at all a designated contact. And so they kind of just recognizing that they didn't have yet authorization, they kind of moved into like high pressure sort of cajoling, you know, very friendly uh, encouragement for her to accept this destination. And, and they were, and, and she was assured that when she got there, she would get exactly the same kinds of things that she was getting in this out of ICU room, which really she hadn't gotten much of anything because they did next, they did next to nothing for her during those 12 hours once she was out of ICU. They basically just, it was like a holding cell until they moved her out of the hospital altogether. So, but you know, but the things that she were getting, she was getting in the hospital included an IV and it included daily blood panels so that we as a family or, you know, friends and family were able to track the status of her kidneys, for example. And so when that person moved over to the facility, you know, after being told she was going to get all of these things, from the time she went in, there was no IV given. Uh, five days into the process, we spoke with the director of nursing who informed us that no blood panels had been done. And, and we knew how weak she was. And, and we could just hear this person declining, 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 declining. And she just kept declining. And then one day she just, you know, very, very shortly into this process, she began to tell us that she was having literally, you know, full body pain that was really uncomfortable for her. And she had never at any time during the, the 12 days in the hospital, minus uh, two, she was two, she was in for 48 hours and then she was in for eight days. Uh, and there was like a 48 hour period in between. And so um, her, her, she got to the point where she was really uncomfortable. And we were distressed that they weren't giving her what she really needed to, um, to not be in pain, we felt like. So at this point, this pain, and this is why I asked the question about general pain. I was just wondering, could, could the pain that she had never experienced before in the hospital have been the result of basic deprivation that she was being subjected to in this rehab, which we later found out is a facility that does both rehab and hospice. So, you know, what appears to be the case is that she was told, we were all told, you know, the people on the phone who were her medical contacts were absolutely assured that she was going to get rehab treatment in this rehab facility. But once she got there, 
what we seem to be seeing is exactly what you would expect according to the article that I'm looking at right now about hospice, where it talks about certain things are not paid for by, um, like when it lists the disadvantages, right? It says um, that in addition, other treatments or procedures considered life prolonging, nasogastric or feeding tube, for example, might not be covered under hospice. So it, it appears that this, you know, the, the reason why we think that they actually flipped to a hospice designation was because the actual discharge document, the very first thing that it said about this patient, was that she was a hospice patient. Whereas when you go... Okay, let, in, me, let me start... Uh, hold on, yes, hold on. Yes, let, let me step back for a minute. Okay. First of all, I'll give you normal practice around the world, at least uh, wherever I've traveled or whichever hospital I've visited in different countries and all that. And I'll tell you what we follow here. Anybody in ICU is never discharged straight from the ICU. Right. Unless they're dead. Yes. Unless they're dead. Okay. But when they're dead, they go straight to the morgue and then they're gone. Okay. If they're alive, they have what's called step-down procedures and protocols. Right. So you go from an ICU to a sub-ICU and then you go to the ward or private room and then, you, then only if you're fit, you're sent home. Unless you're discharged against medical advice. Now, many times the family or the patient will insist on getting discharged so they can transfer to another hospital and they get discharged against medical advice. Right. So, so the two, I mean, I find, I find it odd that she was discharged from an ICU and straight into a rehab or a hospice center. Right. Secondly, the question I would raise is, was she misled? Was she uh, lied to? Was she misinformed that she was going from a hospital to a similar hospital, another hospital, without classically explaining the, what would be available in that hospital? That's, those are the two points I find odd with this whole picture that you are describing to me. Right. Well, on the 10th of August, according to her discharge documents, um, it says patient wants to hold off on hospice care at this time wants to remain full code. You were telling me that that's not a term that you use in, in India, but I, apparently that means they want to receive all treatments. And, and the words right after Correct. that are actually and receive treatment. And then skipping now, that was on the 6th of August. That was the first day, first full day that she was in ICU. They put that into her record. So she made that very clear from, from the minute she went into the ICU that she really did want all treatment. And in fact, they did give her a really amazingly... Um, it, effective and probably very expensive treatment, uh, which was a thrombectomy that I can possibly find the full name for later. Um, it, it used, are you familiar with the term Inari, I-N-A-R-I? Um, don't know if I can find it. In no. Uh, it's, there it it's, is. Okay, it's, it's, uh, you're talking about uh, she pul had, she had, pulmonary embolism yes. and thrombectomy. Yes. The way they describe okay. it, they describe it uh, under the... Uh, in one of the days of their hospital course details, they say that the patient is status post bilateral lower extremity aspiration thrombectomy with inari. Okay, so when you go above, on a day before that, she stated that she wanted to receive full treatment. Two days later, they also note that the patient notes that she wants everything done at this point. And then on the next to the last day of her stay in the ICU, it specifically states patient revoked hospice. Now, furthermore, it states that the patient was currently on room air. So the thrombectomies, as noted in this article, I mean, in this document, and also by our friend, the day she had the first of two thrombectomies done, one on the left side of her body, one on the right, um, she could not believe how much better she felt when it came to her breathing and her chest pressure, etc. She was unbelievably happy about how she hadn't felt that good in, in a very long time. The, the pulmonary embolism, the, <laughs> the Embolism. pulmonary embolisms were just really Embolism. pervasive. You know, there was like the, um, I think they, let me see if I can find the word clot in this document. Yes. Uh, it says that there was a consult scheduled with a certain doctor for directed thrombectomy eval, given the patient's large clot burden. 
Okay, and that was like uh, right around the time when they did the first one. So she had a tremendous number of clots removed. They actually showed them to her after the procedure. Um, and once that was done, she was just, it was like, you know, her lungs were great. And then there was a reference to her um, physical exam where it said that she was alert with no acute distress, that her lungs were clear to auscultation, breathe, breath sounds are equal, symmetrical chest wall expansion, cardiovascular was normal rate, regular rhythm, no murmur and no edema, gastrointestinal was soft, non-tender, non-distended, no, I hate this word, organomegaly. And then neurologic, she was alert, oriented, and no focal deficits. So it sounds like as of her di discharge, she was fully competent to decide whether she did or didn't want to revoke hospice. But what is disturbing about this discharge document is the very first thing it says up on the top first line as it describes what's going on. It says hospice patient coming from home, COVID positive, so, so that's the disconnect you are, you, are, you are having. Yes. Because yes, she 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 did not want to go to hospice. Right. First of all, I have I have two dis disconnects. One is you never send somebody from the ICU to another to a hospice or to a non-stable environment. You send them, you stabilize them, get them stable enough before they can go to a rehab or uh, I mean in, in this case a hospice. Right. Now. They directly sent her from an ICU to a hospice, and and against her wishes. Yes. But she has clearly mentioned no hospice. Right. And uh, so that's that. Those are the two questions you got to ask. Well, I mean, I'm not I'm not qualified for that, but I can just tell you, this is very unusual to see somebody being sent from the ICU straight into hospice. Right. So that's one thing that they did against her will. The second thing that they did against her will against her will, which, which she stated multiple times, was that she did not want to receive remdesivir, remdesivir. And on the 6th, she was, she was basically, um, she came to the emergency room on the 5th. On the 6th, they gave her remdesivir against her wishes. And we spoke with them while she was still in the emergency room. We said to them, you know that she refuses uh, remdesivir. And they said, yes, we're aware of that. And within probably 12 hours, they gave her the first dose. Another uh, 24 hours later, they gave her the second dose. And then the record states that she refused further doses. It is almost certain that she did not ever change her mind and that she was never told that she was going to be given it, that they just gave it to her after she said no. And then someone probably said, okay, we're going to give you the third dose. And she's like, no, no, I don't want that. And so apparently she only got two doses. But then we saw the, the decline in her EGFR scores, two, which had two, been stable two, all the way since. Two or three. I've got, I've yes. got a few comments here. Go ahead. On, on the remdesivir issue. Either, either I mean, well, what I don't know, did she get any kind of sedation? Um, uh, and during that time when she was sedated, did they take permission from, uh, consent from any other family member? Well, I guess the question is. Anybody. No, oh. Hold on, Mike. Let me finish on what I'm saying. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. That, that's one, one thing. The second thing is, did they not bother to even ask her permission again and just gave her the first dose and second dose? And when they actually asked her the third time, she said, no, no, I don't want it. That's also possible in the hospital. Right. And the nurses assume that the other nurse has already taken consent. The doctor has written remdesivir. The remdesivir has to be given. Patient has been consented. That's assumption made by the nursing staff. So it's now there may have been a nurse who came in for the third dose and said, "By the way, ma'am, you're be giving. I'm giving you the third dose." And uh, and at that time she said, "No, I don't want remdesivir." But the other two nurses may not have even asked her and may have just injected it into her without her knowing about it. Well, what's kind so of that's curious. that's another area of concern. Yeah? Yeah, I was going to say what's curious is at least one of those days she received remdesivir and the thrombectomy on the same day. And so it's altogether possible that the thrombectomy, I mean, that the remdesivir was administered after they sedated her with fentanyl and dosed. Um, that's possible. I mean, so, so that the, she didn't even know that it was my, being done on my, that day. My assumption, my, I mean, my, sorry, my read, not my assumption, my read of the, what you're telling me is that they assumed 
that she had consented and they just gave her administered remdesivir without uh, even waiting till she wakes up and then when she is fully conscious asking her again right because she had not consented to it earlier from what you're telling me so if from it, what you're reading out to me she had definitely not consented to remdesivir ever right okay number one number two uh, mistakes happen people nurses make these assumptions and give medicine sure. without even consenting or asking the patient they just go in and just give it but their job is to give it right right i mean they should they assume that if it's written in a file to be given it has to be given uh, they don't really ask the consent maybe the third nurse asked that question and that's why you you're hearing the no but it also i'm, I'm going to go back to a thing what you got to check out is to qualify for that bonus for the extra payment from the government the government the government pays out government or the company or both pay out uh, a, a large amount of money for for remdesivir mm -hmm. i think for the five days you've got to give the two day two day dosage minimum to qualify for that payment right and the hospital and nurses may have been trying to uh, uh you know hit that milestone of two days treatment right so that they can claim it from the government or claim it from the insurance or claim it from where the company or whoever was paying for it i i don't know the 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 format and the the kind of a framework how that is paid out right but from my understanding and again that's something you guys you need to check out so it, it two days doesn't qualify for the full payment so and the government, government or the insurance or somebody has a fixed okay. uh, payment payment time. Whether you give two or five, it makes no difference, right? Would you expect also that just for the fact that she tested positive, that the hospital would get some kind of additional uh, subsidization from, say, for instance, the federal government or the state government? Yeah, I mean, the federal government pay, has, has paid out and does pay out uh, for COVID patients. Uh, for for I'm I don't know what remdes were for deaths they've paid out a, a, a you know every patient with who dies off COVID or dies with COVID gets the, the hospital gets a certain certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know the numbers. I don't know what the numbers are, but uh, that that's my understanding. That's my reading of what the what's been happening in the U.S. Well, I would assume it's number not one. just number if two, they die, right? It's hmm? if they just if they just have that, COVID. Number two, uh, mm. unless you give two do two doses. Maybe the company does not reimburse. Uh, I mean, the company has to be paid. Right. And uh, maybe there's a minimum uh, thing to to uh, minimum quantity to achieve to get a certain pricing, rebates and all that. I don't I don't know the details of the hospital or details of the case, Mike. So I can't give you right. hard hard answers. Is okay? it still really standard of care to use remdesivir at the present time? No. 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 I. Uh, I mean, I know you don't use. I, mean, rarely, I know you have a very different protocol I, I, than what I, we have in the United States. But I'm, I guess what I'm really asking is, for standard American care, as you follow in the, you know, in the things that you're reading, is it really, is that considered the best thing you can give somebody that's approved by, say, a Dr. Fauci or the CDC or the FDA, uh, or is there something I mean, that we're using instead of remdesivir typically now? No, there's nothing. There's nothing that I mean. Remdesivir is still the standard of care uh, from the, even though it's been condemned, uh, and lots of patients have died of it. People, I mean, the hospital just give it. There's nothing you can do. Well, I guess what I was getting at you know, was, you know, President Biden and Jill Biden just got COVID in the last few weeks. Neither of them, to my knowledge, got remdesivir. Both got Paxlovid. But, but they were not. They were not. They were not hospitalized. Oh, that's they true. Were, they, they, that's true. They were. Treated at home. I see. Yes. So, for in a hospital setting, it's still remdesivir. In the hospital setting, I'm a, I'm, I, from what my information, limited information, it is right. still remdesivir in the U.S. Is it widely used in India at the present time? No, it has come down dramatically. Come down the usage. Mm -hmm. Dramatic come down. What are some of the things in, fact, in the hospital admission, setting? In our, uh, admission rates have come down dramatically. Right. But I mean, when a person is in the hospital with COVID in India, is remdesivir used or is something else used as like the first line attack? 
There are, there are multiple drugs that you can use. You use steroids, high dose steroids can be used. Remdesivir is used, tocilizumab is used. Uh, the hospital will give the patient's relatives a choice of what, what all can be given, and they make the choice. And they give the rationale for why they want to give it, what is the date, uh, how, how, uh, you know, how many days since the onset of symptoms. Everything is, all these decisions are made based on, on the, on the uh, like when in the disease process in the 14 days of the disease process the patient is. Right. If the patient in, usually remdesivir is given, I think in the five, first five days or first seven days, right. same with map. Giving it on day 14 and 13 and 12 and 17 doesn't make sense. At that time you give steroids, mm -hmm. you give uh, Lovanox, you give he heparin, you give intravenous heparin instead of giving Lovanox, or give Lovanox instead of heparin. So, so there are treatment treatment modules, you know, in the later phase of the COVID. I, I don't don't know what what your hospital in the U.S. do in that late second week, in the late period of second week, say from day 11, mm. 12, 13, 14. Okay, here they will they will bombard the patient with steroids and uh, either heparin, intravenous heparin, or uh, subcutaneous administration of lovenox, right? Or well, what's called an oxyparin. Okay. So Why can we be done? I got to. I got to take a call. I got to okay. leave now. Okay. Can I quickly ask mind. one question? Okay. Chronic kidney disease. If a person had chronic kidney disease stage three A, would that, in your mind, be a red flag? For a person that had no symptoms of COVID yet, they were completely asymptomatic at the point that they got the positive test. Would would that be like a, an adverse risk benefit kind of situation to give remdesivir to a person with chronic kidney disease? Absolutely, and absolutely. No symptoms. If she's got no symptoms and she's just COVID, why didn't they give her Paxlovid or give her molnupiravir? Right. Why give remdesivir? You've got Paxlovid. You've got uh, molnupiravir. Those are drugs for people who are not, uh, they may be hospitalized, but they are not, you know, badly symptomatic. They're not on a vent. They're not on a, on a, they, they, you can, they can take uh, the tablets. Why push remdesivir at that time? Those are my, those are my uh, professional viewpoints here. Okay, so this has been an interview with Dr. Daryl DeMello. His last name is spelled capital D-E, capital M-E-L-L-O. You can find numerous interviews that he has done with various uh, doctors and others around the world who have been focused on the treatment of COVID around the world, and especially on YouTube and other platforms like Rumble and Odyssey. And so thank you, Dr. Mello, for answering my questions. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you.